Uh, so th this presentation is going to be somewhat different than the previous ones. It's not as technical, but rather hopefully um, informative. Um, so I'm Maciej Wronietzki, and I'm a partner at Stufish. And we're a group of architects, uh, designers, engineers, and overall creatives. Um, and we look to kind of challenge the entertainment industry and propose new and innovative solutions to uh, better engage the audience. That's kind of engaging the audience is the whole key of what we do. So here's a little showreel of ours. So that's, that's mainly some of the more recent work that we've done. Uh, now, the founder of the studio, um, this amazing man, Mark Fisher, the late and great, uh, he started as an architect, uh, and he practiced as an architect for a little bit, but found out that it wasn't really for him. Uh, and by chance, he uh, started working with Pink Floyd and developing and building their inflatables, and that's how kind of our studio started just by happenstance, by wanting to start something, something new. And when uh, Mark started, the industry looked more like something on the left, and that's Beatles playing uh, Shea Stadium in 1966. And Ringo Starr's quote kind of says it all, that the thing he remembers the most from that is how far they were away from the audience. And then in uh, 2009, when we did The Claw for U2, everything had changed. Uh, but it took a lot to get from one side to the other. A lot of work, a lot of testing, a lot of technology needed to advance and be challenged, new ideas being proposed. Um, now, uh, this is, sorry, this is a bit slow here. So this is a body of our work since um, The Wall. This is about 150 projects. This isn't all of them, but these are the key ones, and it took all of that to kind of get where we are right now in stage design, but also architecture. Our company doesn't only do sets. We also do permanent buildings, venues, any kind of space that engages any kind of audience. Anybody that looks and interacts with our work, this is, this is our key demographic. Uh, and I'm going to kind of cover two aspects of our work. One is on the show side, and one is on the venue. It'll be very focused uh, with few examples showing that there's a linear path of progression, that we always kind of challenge, uh, challenge the notion of what is standard in the industry and try to, try to propel it forward in, in, into new ways. Um, and so milestones for our company are very important. Uh, and the drawing you see there is by Mark. That's uh, Bridges to Babylon, which was this fantastic uh, bridge that came out over the audience from A stage to B stage. Um, was designed by Atelier One, um, broke on the first night. But the, the key milestones that I'll be covering that kind of define our office and define how we are approaching our work are uh, Animals in 1977 for Pink Floyd and The Wall in 1980, Steel Wheels in 1989, and then a seminal moment in our practice's history, Pop Mart for U2 in 1997. Uh, in 2004, uh, Ka, which was now a new typology, architecturally speaking, for our practice because we're in a venue and we're designing the auditorium, the stage. We're expanding, we're diversifying in a way. Uh, U2 360 in 2009, and then I'll kind of touch on a few things and how we're moving ahead in our practice and in what we do. So in 1977, Animals, that, that uh, dashing fellow there is Mark with his inflatable, designed these... Uh, uh, inflatables to float above the band. Now, why is it a milestone? This is the first time that a band actually hired a design team. Engineers, designers, and artists to stage an event with scenic elements. And it was fantastic. Um, Mark designed and built these pigs, and these pigs at the end of the concert would fly up 
go behind stage and with an igniter and propane, they'd explode to great fanfare. Uh, Mark and an amazing man, Richard Hartman, then, and the last concert that this happened, I uh, filled it with a bit of too much hydrogen and, and uh, the tether snapped that held them back and it fell down molten and broke a lot of cars, so Roger Waters didn't want to do that anymore. What was really interesting here as well is in order to get those uh, inflatables to, to, to float above the band, because there wasn't any scaffolding here, this, this wasn't a, that kind of stage set, uh, Ted Happold and, and Fry Otto were called in, very famous engineers, to design these uh, umbrellas that came out of the stage set and hover above the band. So there was really a lot of innovation already starting there. Uh, 1980, Pink Floyd, it's a milestone because this is the first theatrical rock and roll uh, show. That's a sketch Mark did, a four-point four perspective. You can see Teacher there and then Teacher in real life. Also, uh, this was uh, Mark Fisher and Jonathan Park at that time. They engineered that, designed Teacher. But what's really amazing about this concert was how Mark designed the flipper, uh, which would knock down the wall. So the way that the concert, I'm not sure if everybody's aware, but you know, the wall was built during the concert. It was that big statement. And then at the very end, the wall came crashing down. And in order to come down, um, Mark and uh, Jonathan Park designed this flipper that would come down inside these bricks and destabilize the wall, and you'd have that great effect at the very end of the concert. Uh, again, in 2010, we rejoined with uh, Roger Waters for the other uh, wall tour. 1989, uh, Steel Wheels for the Rolling Stones. This was Mark's first big, full, holistic stage design. Uh, and this really propelled his career. He almost didn't do this uh, because it had to be a free pitch. Mark couldn't afford it, but then he couldn't afford to let go of the stones. Uh, so that really started him to what then became us. This is where Stoofish, as we are now, this band of, of uh, creative brothers and sisters, uh, Pop Mart. And Pop Mart's an obvious uh, milestone because it set a benchmark for the whole industry. Largest low-res LED screen ever made by uh, Seiko. And this would start to inform a lot of what we do and a lot of what's seen around here, all of this low-res screen that gives this transparency. And that was a, a, a beautiful byproduct from the Seiko-developed LEDs there. You can see the, the panels. There were two sets of 240 panels that made up, um, I forget the description, it was the world's largest video screen with the tallest cocktail stick impaling the biggest olive ever stuffed. That's, that's a pretty cool description for something uh, iconic. Um, now, what was really quite wonderful as a discovery in the States that was the transparency that happened in the screen when it was backlit. When there wasn't content and the screen was backlit, there was this quality to it that was just waiting to be misused somewhere else. And I'll get to where it's misused again for you 2 and with Seiko later on. So 2004, Milestone, Ka, Cirque du Soleil in Vegas. How do we rethink the auditorium? How do we extend the auditorium? How do we challenge how a theater actually works? We bring it into the auditorium. We bring the scenic elements of the stage into the auditorium and make it immersive. Before there was AR or VR, this was Im an immersive experience. The scenes were happening around you. You were on the stage almost. And added to that, it, the stage was also rethought as a uh, dynamic platform that could tilt and yaw, go vertical, and the performers were actually held inside. Uh, the platform, the stage rather, had uh, kinetic elements that came out so that acrobats could actually jump around and do all of their, their bits on it. This was a completely new typology for stage design. This was the auditorium now performing as a performer, much like the living performers. 2009, U2360, I'm sure everybody um, knows this. This was in collaboration with Willie Williams and Frederick Opsimer and Atelier One. Um, it's obvious why that's a milestone. It's the highest grossing concert, the biggest set to travel the world in 110 uh, trucks, uh, a pantograph screen that would um, expand above the band. It was in the round, no back of house. It was an incredible feat of engineering. It was a wonderful idea. It democratized an event. It was an end on. Um, and because Mark was part of um, how the, the stage building industry actually evolved, 
the intelligence and the design and how it's assembled, how it travels, and then how it disassembles and leaves was also quite quite a first. Nothing of this scale was, was traveling at that time because it was far too complex. But with clever designing, um, this traveled the world for years and disappeared just as quickly. Uh, 2008 isn't necessarily a milestone, but it's a turning point for our practice. Uh, Beijing Olympics, Mark was called in to uh, consult uh, initially, but then became uh, very involved in certain elements, uh, like the globe, uh, designing the globe. This was rebuilt recently, I found out, in, uh, around Hubei. Uh, actually that, and it's still a telescopic globe coming out the ground. Um, this was a wild success, and it actually opened the practice up to new, ever-increasing typologies. So going from set and theater to actually then uh, building. Post the Olympics, this is where Stu Fish starts to redefine where its focus is. What, what are we actually trying to, to address? And we were addressing the venues and the shows. The venues and how they performed, how they supported a show, and how a show with elements like a screen and, and a stage can be repurposed? How can we redefine what those standards of the industry actually are? Um, we would extend the stage, we would expand the scene, all in the goal of actually engaging the audience in some new way, something that could con continuously propel. Uh, two, 2010 then, uh, we were asked to design the hand show for Franco Dragon in Wuhan, China. Now, much like Carl, we had to think, how do we redefine how a auditorium performs? How does it support a show? Externally, there's an expression of that, that this extension of the auditorium and the show outwardly with this uh, bi-disc facade, 18,000 LED discs with four-point LEDs that would uh, run content to express it. It was very loud, but it, quite simple and straightforward. But internally, uh, what was really important about this theater was the way that it revealed the performance physically for the audience. Um, the seating revealed an act that the audience then became a performance. Much like in, in Ka, you were just observing, but you were within the performance. Within this theater, uh, the swing seats in the lower tier would open up, revealing a deep pool in this, in, this, in this auditorium. And then the upper tier seating would drop seven and a half meters to create a kind of proscenium thrust. So you go from a proscenium to a semi-in-the-round thrust with a dry and wet stage. Um, and just to kind of clarify how exactly that, that, uh, that works. So this was happening while the show was going on. Nobody would expect it. The ambient temperature would affect the water. Everybody would feel it. It would become a wholly physical experience when it happened. Added to that, how do you, how do you push that a little bit more? You know, referencing uh, U2360, we had three robotic arms with uh, uh, 7 by 15 LED screens that would sit on the, on the ends. And these screens would go proud of the dry stage and over the audience when it was still a dry stage and become performers in themselves, a backdrop to performers, but also do their own bits. That's, that's still running. On the show side, we question the screen, the LED screen. How can a screen become something physical, not just by bending or boxing, but how can it become sculptural? So for Robbie Williams' TTC tour, we scanned his head in order to make a big statement, uh, and then got to working in building that out in large parts before there was parametric design, this 50 mil pitch, all of these perforations you see were done by hand, were f filled with LEDs by hand and wired, and it was very laborious. But the ultimate goal was how could we create a sculptural screen, a massive statement that worked during the day and surprised at night when the gig was at its height. When it was lit during the night, it also still worked. It was still ever present. The gig went on. But then when you started to mix media and you went from just a sculptural piece and then running a variety of content, this was something new. This was a start of something trying to define how a flat surface can actually have a lot more three-dimensionality, which would go on to another uh, project that I'll talk about just a, a little later. And then on the venue side, uh, after that, we looked at the Dai Show. This was a, a, a theater in Shishuangbana, China, 
Um, and our remit was quite expansive there. This was a, almost a holistic project for us where we designed the landscape, the facade, the structure, the auditorium, the scenic elements. Um, and we were influenced, obviously, by nature because there was a very uh, regional cultural influence that needed to be kept. That's my mom there next to a massive palm frond. That became the language for the, uh, for, for the theater. Sorry. Uh, which had these folded, this folded roof, this, this palm frond roof. And it's this organic quality that we chose to, to fill the auditorium with and then express it externally on the facade. So it wasn't that you had to go into the theater to get a sense that you were within the scene. Just approaching the building, you were approaching the scene. You were approaching the scenic elements of the show. And they propagated internally. We did the interior design as well to take on this, this vernacular. Uh, and then internally, that structure was expressed as a, as a designed grid that was also folded integrating all of the lighting and TSC elements. Um, we had a, a serious height restriction here because of a flight path, so it was very compressed. Um, but we had 10 acrobatic gates, these kind of donut gates that were in the, I guess you'd call it the tree canopy, the grid. Uh, and that allowed creatures to perform above the audience. And anyway, it, the whole notion of language architecture came from the proscenium. These, these uh, banyan roots that grew out of the stage, this was a wet dry stage, into, this, into the roof grid where you had that, that folded nature and then out outside. What was a nice discovery here was that because the climate allowed us to have the lobby exposed, it wasn't contained, it was out, outdoor, an open air lobby, we, could, we started to actually think about a pre-show, an outdoor pre-show because the sight lines were quite good from the first floor lobby, which you're seeing here. We started to see how can the nature of a theater split, that you have a performance inside that's thicketed, but you actually have a pre-show outside that's all part of the experience, extending it outside a little bit further so that you start to blend that nature. Uh, 2018, U2 Experience and Essence Tour. Now this is in collaboration with Willie Williams and uh, Frederick Opsimer, which I think is here somewhere. The screen and the stage. At this point, they're becoming a single thing. You can, in, you can inhabit the screen, much like we were trying to do with Robbie Williams and seeing how it can become physical. This is splitting that screen in half and putting the performance on the inside. You can extend the performance by just using it as a standard screen, but you can also split that screen and make a stage at the bottom of it so it's a thin platform where the performers can run up and down. But then you really start to use that low res where you mix the live and the digital and Bono spits on the edge, and, and it, you're really hybridizing now that technology and letting stars walk on stars as an added bonus. Here we get kind of full circle, right? 1997, we have Pop Mart, and the introduction of the low res, massive LED screen, and then in 2018, with the same players, um, we produce the big screen that was used in that tour. Now looking ahead, just one example of what we're currently working on, and there's, there's a lot, but just kind of in this thread. We, we did a research project on how we can expand the idea of holding these pre-show areas in front of theaters that could support them. In this case, we used a medium mesh connected to a roof awning that would, ex that would extend out over this kind of external amphitheater, but then look at designing the lobby space to look down onto that space. So people that were ticketed and already inside had a fantastic view, like a VIP view on the space, but the public also had their kind of space for, to enjoy these public performances. And we use that concept on a winning project that we're currently working on, on the Keller Auditorium in Portland. And the whole one big move for this architecture was focusing on a very famous fountain designed by uh, Halpern, um, which was originally meant to be a public performance stage. This was a fountain, but it was always meant to be a performance area. And the auditorium kind of almost in a way faced its back to this fountain. We decided to uh, include new program, a restaurant and bar, curve the facade so it was orientating itself down to this uh, stage at the bottom and start to generate the life. So this was a dual aspect uh, lobby, effectively, one looking at public performances and the other allowing access into the auditorium for those ticketed performances. Um, but going forward, uh, I guess 
the real key points to end on, the, the ethos of how we move forward learning from what we've done in the past are kind of three approaches that we have to, to how we develop, how we design our work. Um, one, we don't have a house style, but a, a house ambition. And we believe that real good, unique design is born from curiosity. It's a, it, it's every project that we do, the typologies are just all over the place. Every project is unique, every requirement is unique, uh, and every context is unique. So we can't we can't approach it with one ready to go cookie cutter style. Everything is brand new. Uh, secondly, we have to challenge the standards. The things that have been used before, we have to reuse them and misuse them. Because we believe that uniqueness uh, is born of misuse. When you get a thing, you have to break that thing apart and see what else it can do. How can you misuse technology that's already working fantastically? It hasn't all been figured out. You know, there's all of these simple things can do much, much more. And we have to be always be conscious who we're designing for. The people that are right under the stage at Beyonce's concert, or above the stage uh, in Bigger Bang for Rolling Stones, or walking past our buildings outside, just general pedestrians, or ticketed internally and watching a show that uh, we had hand in. Uh, we designed for an audience. Thank you. There aren't any questions, I assume. Good? Yes? No? Oh, no. Yeah. Right, can you hear me OK? I'm yeah. just wondering, that, you know, <laughs> live... Oh, I'm probably too, 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 no, too no, loud. No, no, it's good. Um, live live uh, performances are becoming more and more popular, and it's growing as an industry, probably more so than it's ever been. Are those who see live performance going to start to want to see the experience and, and fantastic effects and adventurous, you know, uh, environments you create at live events in other environments, in, you know, where AV, AV and AR yeah, and all that? Yeah, you know, they're going to start to want to create ideas for themselves in other environments well, from what they see as avid concert goers. So they want to yeah. replicate that in, uh, in other areas. But, but, but do, you, do you mean that more like in, in augmented spaces where you're, you're kind of taking away the reality of being mashed up with 30,000 people? Well, or? in terms of concepts, you know, rethinking spaces based on oh, no, absolutely. the creativity that you show uh, oh, no, in no, the way no, you yeah. differentiate between these events. Uh, th th look, there, there are, we have to be able to look back at what we've designed and see where it was a failure. Not necessarily a failure, but could have been better. And venues that are fixed for a single type of show are just not viable anymore. Uh, flexibility in an auditorium, uh, uh, the basic idea of a black box theater, right? Where you can completely reconfigure the auditorium and the lighting and the grid to support a variety of shows is, is really, really important. But when you're, when you're talking about 7,000 seats, it becomes really, really difficult, right? Uh, we just designed actually a, a 7,600 seat theater in Zhuhai, um, in outside of Guangdong in, in, in um, Guangzhou in China. And you know, you t we're thinking about flexibility, 7,600 seats. It's just like, well, how can you make it flexible? How can you repurpose this for a completely different show? We haven't figured that out. But for 2,000 seat venues, we're, we're actively working on proposing completely new structures for, for performative venues. I mean that, that's kind of our, architecturally, that's our greatest ambition. I mean, you're doing some amazing things based on a, a fresh challenge every time, but you're probably using ideas from what you used beforehand. But if I'm looking at creating, we're moving into that, into that area of AV now, where we're, you know, we're trying to think of things differently, and, and, and we're yearning for fresh ideas from mm. different environments we can use and think of practically to create new things ourselves, and these sort of things. We're, technology is fine, but we're lacking on the creative and design side. And I think we're moving back to that because people are think, getting a bit fed up of technology for its own sake, and they want to reintroduce this creativity and artistic vision yeah. that we've been lacking. But that, those skills are somehow slightly short. But you know, well, I, I, watching I, what you're doing could well inspire them to do, behave a bit more bravely and there's try a, there's new a, things. There's a project that we're currently working on where uh, conceptually it's completely figured out, but. <laughs> None of the supporting technology exists, right? So it, it's bespoke uh, throughout, and we're going to have to R&D it for, 
I don't know, half a year probably. But uh, you know, it, that, that's, where, that's why, those are the kind of projects you, know, you live for. Because as long as somebody can fund it, you know, you're, you're going to introduce something new into the industry. Thank you for that. Um, very, very insightful. Um, I actually worked on a couple of the shows that you guys designed, so thanks for that. That was a long couple right. of weeks. <laughs> um, just, uh, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on smaller types of auditorium or, or kind of multi-purpose spaces. Um, you know, 200, 300, down to 60, 80. Have you guys kind of worked on that sort of stuff for maybe... What's we have your, done. Yeah. What's your thoughts on, on, on audience engagements in the, in the kind of smaller context to, you know, big auditoria? Yeah, I mean, into it's, it's, a, it's a scalability issue because of you, you, you're either in a more controlled acoustically space or um, it, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve, whether or not it's a, a full, fully manipulable space or it's purpose-built for a specific kind of, of event. We've, we've done... We have worked on smaller venues that were around 200, scaling down to about 50, um, but they were quite limited in spoke, uh, in scope. Um, the majority of our venues are, again, like around uh, 1,200 to 7,000 seats, um, which is great. But uh, but but again, the smaller venues allow you to kind of integrate a lot more into them because there's a lot less stuff that you have to get into them. Uh, seating, you know, there's so much advancement in uh, seating technology, retractable seats, and and y you know, uh, I'm I'm missing the name now. Gala seating, you know, G Gala's been around for a long time, and they're on the cusp, I'm sure, of a new, a completely new kind of seat that can retract and disappear without requiring uh, six meters of basement to, to to hide all of it, because you know that's always the the, the problem. But yeah, uh, that's all I can really say about that. Okay, thank you very much.